Everyone, I'm Kate Ford, and we have concluded closed session this evening. And on July 20th, 2021, at 6.30 p.m., I'm calling to order this regular meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School District School Board, the first of the 2021-2022 school year. And now for information about interpretation for this meeting. Thank you, President Ford. Good afternoon. I will give this interpretation announcement in both English and Spanish. Buenas tardes. Voy a dar este anuncio sobre la interpretación en inglés y en español. In order to provide language access, we will be providing simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish. If you are bilingual, you do not have to click anything. If you are not bilingual in English and Spanish, you will have to select your language in order to hear the interpretation. If you are on a laptop or desktop, at the bottom right of your screen, you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. Please click on the globe now and select English. If you are on an iPad or a phone, locate the three dot menu and select language interpretation, then select English and click done. When it's your turn to speak, please remember to be loud and clear and speak at a moderate pace. We are also offering American Sign Language interpretation for this meeting. If you will be using ASL interpretation, please use the Zoom app on your computer, tablet or phone to join this meeting. If you join this meeting through your web browser, you may not be able to see the ASL interpreter at all times. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Esta reunión contará con interpretación simultánea en inglés y en español. Si usted es bilingüe, no tiene que presionar nada. Si no es bilingüe, tendrá que elegir su idioma para escuchar la interpretación. Si está usando una computadora, va a ver un icono abajo de su pantalla a la derecha en forma de globo que dice interpretación. Haga clic ahí ahora y seleccione español. Si está usando un iPad o su teléfono, localice el menú de tres puntos o un botón que diga más. Haga clic en interpretación de idiomas, elija español y finalizar o done. Cuando sea su turno de hablar, por favor recuerde hablar con voz fuerte y clara y a un paso moderado. También ofrecemos interpretación del lenguaje de señas americano para esta reunión. Si utilizará este servicio, utilice la aplicación de Zoom en su computadora, tableta o teléfono para ingresar a esta reunión. Si ingresó a esta reunión a través de su navegador web, es posible que no pueda ver al intérprete del lenguaje de señas en todo momento. Gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Dr. Maldonado, please lead us now in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Please stand. Face the flag. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now we'll and now we'll continue with the agenda. First of all, during closed session, we took the following action. A motion was made by Ms. Alvarez and seconded by Ms. Sims Moten to unanimously approve the appointment of Sonia Amaral as the principal of La Cuesta and Alta Vista. And as I said, it was unanimously approved. And also um, a motion was made by Ms. Munoz and seconded by Ms. Alvarez to approve the appointment of Mauricio Ortega as director of uh, ETS, and that was unanimously approved by the board. A new school year begins tonight for the board, and the challenges of COVID-19 continue. As you can see, board and cabinet are once again in person, in masks, and while the public may participate through live streaming on YouTube. We really look forward to seeing you in person soon, someday, and we're still very grateful that many of you have been able to participate in our meetings from your homes. We look forward to inviting the public back to the boardroom as soon as we have ensured everyone's safety and received the go-ahead from County Public Health. Tonight is also the first board meeting for our student representative, Mr. Dawson Kelly. Welcome. Um, Dawson will participate in our meetings to the full extent, fullest extent possible with the caveat that he will not attend closed session due to confidentiality issues. He'll also be invited to vote on action items, but uh, only in an advisory capacity, and he can always choose to not vote on an item. And today, as before, we have two regularly scheduled reports, the COVID-19 report at 7 and the Summer of Learning report at 8. 
Um, the board is planning to take a 10 minute break at 8.30 or as close to it as possible. And so now, Dr. Maldonado, will you continue with your report to the board? Absolutely. Good evening once again, Board President Ford, members of the board, staff, and public parents who are with us today. For today's report, I would like to begin by introducing our uh, amazing new cabinet member, Ms. Kim Hernandez. We'd like to welcome her. She is the new Assistant Superintendent of Fiscal Services. I am so uh, grateful to Ms. Hernandez for uh, agreeing to come join us at Santa Barbara Unified, where only the best employees work. <laughs> and I've asked her to share a little bit about herself, as well as to provide us uh, a brief update on important legislative and fiscal impacts that have transpired since we last met a couple of um, weeks ago. So with that said, Ms. Kim Hernandez. Thank you. Um, can I take, you okay. can take, I'll take this off so you can see my face for, see who I am. Um, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to be here. It's, uh, it's been such a, an opportunity to um, take this new role as the Assistant Superintendent of Business Services. Um, and I'm just really excited about it. I, I uh, was sharing that I come every day, every day, just excited and ready to go. And every day is a different day um, and full of uh, adventures here. And you are right, it is a place full of great people. Um, everybody has been really supportive and very kind. Um, I am, uh, this feels a little bit like coming home for me because um, I grew up in Santa Barbara. I went to Santa Barbara Unified Schools. So I, um, kindergarten, first grade, Adams, school and I still remember my first grade teacher. Um, second and third grade I was at Harding and then fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth I was at a private school um, which actually ended up being a really good thing because that's where I fell in love with my husband in fifth grade. <laughs> we did not get married then, that would be weird uh, because I was only 10 and he was 11. Um, but, uh, and then that was the only year actually that we were on the same campus. Um, he went to Goleta Valley Junior High and graduated from Dos Pueblos and then went on to Stanford. Um, I went on to UCSB and then got my master's from the University of Denver for systems management. So um, I call this home and this is a very um, nice way to come home, to actually work in the district that I grew up in. So I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I spent the last 14 years working at Santa Barbara SELPA, um, which is the special education organization for the whole Santa Barbara County. So I was the CBO responsible for all the special ed funds that came in um, from the state, federal government grants, all the different things that come in for special education for all the school districts in Santa Barbara County. Um, this one being one of them. So I did have, um, I did know quite a few people um, just from that side of things as I, as I came in. And um, I have two sons uh, who are off in school in um, other countries uh, that I can't even go visit stupid COVID. Um, one is in uh, doing his graduate uh, master's degree from the London School of Economics. And the other one is at, in Canada from the University of British Columbia in pre-med. So all that being said, um, we are a Santa Barbara family, even though right now we're, we're living um, up in the valleys uh, solving. So um, I just am really grateful to be here and um, look forward to having a lot of um, great board meetings with you. So um, I did want to, uh, my recommendation to um, Dr. Maldonado was that I would like to bring forward to the board Anytime we have um, fiscal items that I think you might want to know about, a heads up or, or just um, changes that have happened since the last time we presented to you. Um, so that was something that I would like to do uh, going forward. And if you, my recommendation is if you have any items that you are um, wondering about or would like to have a little more education about, to um, reach out to me and I can do you know little mini presentations on those things. School finance is a very specialized breed <laughs> of um, finance and there are a lot of items that are kind of difficult for you know most people to understand. So my um, 
goal is to try to um, kind of make those obscure sort of items a little more clear and to to educate the board, educate the the public so that um, that all of you feel very confident in in what's going on and and that you know that everything's very transparent. So um, that being said, there's there's a couple things I wanted to just kind of bring up tonight. Um, as as you probably know, um, the the state budget has changed dramatically this year. A lot of it because of COVID and because we ended up a lot better off than um, was originally estimated for our for our state budget. So um, the governor does the the adopted the original budget in January and then it's updated again in May based on any things that we know that have come up between January and May and then it's finally adopted and approved in the June July time frame. So between January and now there have been so many so many things that have changed and a lot of things that will really um, affect our school district and a lot of them very positive um, fiscally positive for us. So a couple of items that um, that that I'll just mention tonight. We know that we have more special education funding coming in um, based on just the the target base rate where the state starts on the allocation that has gone up quite a bit from um, January. It was six hundred and twenty five dollars per ADA and now it's seven hundred and fifteen. So for our school district, that is um, a lot of money. So we'll we'll look into that and see exactly how much that's going to be. Um, we know that there's also more money that's coming in regarding low incidence funding, which is also something that we can tap into. Low incidence of students who are deaf and hard of hearing, visually impaired, orthopedically impaired. Um, so those kinds of things will really help. And we also know that there's some, some funding that's coming for early, um, early intervention for students as well as we're going to be receiving some more federal dollars, which is just amazing because in the whole time that I worked in special education, um, the last time federal funding has just been flat. So the last time we received any increments, any big increases in federal funding was back in 2008, 2009. So we're gonna be receiving more funding based on our President Biden's um, American Recovery Act. So those kinds of things are really going to help us because we do have some, some deficit spending that has been going on, so that's going to help in those areas. We also have a little more money that's going to be coming in for food services, which is also an area that we've, we've had some issues on deficit spending. Just both of those items are, are never fully funded, so it's one of those things where you always have to kind of use some of the general fund for, but we want to try to... Um, reduce that as much as possible. So we have those kinds of um, items that are going to be helping us this year that are, you know, just brand new and just recently announced. So those kinds of things as we go forward throughout the year, I would like to just do little mini presentations for you. And again, if you have anything that you want to know or, you know, are curious about or want me to go research, then just reach out to me and I'll, I can put something together. That's it. Does anybody have any questions for me? Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much. And again, board members, we are very lucky to have stolen uh, Ms. Hernandez, and I have already heard it from my colleagues in the county. So thank you, Kim, and welcome again. Uh, next slide, uh, Mr. Rouse. Uh, board members, there's a couple of questions you asked at the last board meeting. I want to share some work in progress with you. As you recall, we had a five-day professional development for teachers right after the end of the school year. Next week, we will be hosting a leadership institute. And to that end, we want to make sure that now we're looking at how do we take this equity in action and really work with our leaders to transform our school system to do some of the things we've talked about a lot in the last year, which is the, the other pandemic, which is the achievement gap that we need to address for many of our students in our school district. So you'll see here a monitoring student progress uh, for English uh, uh, emerging multilingual learners. This profile will be given to every single school principal. Uh, they will be able, obviously, we, we whited out the names. You'll see here that uh, we will include information at their fingertips for every single student that is an EML with the names listed, with the 
uh, years that they have been in EML, whether or not they're a long-term English learner, whether or not they're qualified as a special ed student, their latest LPAC scores, their latest reading scores, and their grades, which are comprised of the, re the reclassification criteria. Every single principal, like I said, will receive these profiles. We expect to then follow this up with figuring out based on where students are, what they need to do next, and provide them the kinds of interventions that need to take place. As an example, a student may have the grades and the reading scores, but not the LPAC score. So that means we'll work on the language uh, development. Or it may be the opposite. They don't have the grades, but they pass the reading score and they pass the LPAC test. Then we'll need to work with the teachers to look at grading. Why is it that they pass these tests, but the grades are not showing it and so forth. So I just wanted to give you a little taste of, of some of the data dashboard kind of work we're doing. And some of the, and hopefully uh, this answers some of the questions that have been brought up around how are you going to make sure these kids are actually succeeding? And this is a very concrete, evidence based decision making tool that we're going to use going forward. On our next slide, the other question you asked was you know, how are we going to make sure that all these new positions that you have asked to uh, have us uh, approve support school sites? You'll see here, this is just to answer that one question around the new positions. This is not our overall org chart, but this org chart is color coded by purple and green. The green positions are school site based positions. You'll notice that some of them are recurring positions. Some of them say new. I know it's a little bit hard to see. I'll make sure you get a printed copy uh, in front of you in a minute. Um, you'll notice, for example, uh, our assistant principals we revamped a position at every school to have an assistant principal completely dedicated to this multi-tiered system of support, whole child, academics, behavior, social, emotional. There are 12 positions out of those 12, four are new, which are in our elementary. One of them is K-8. We have 12 new MTSS positions at our schools. Again, these are all brand new positions. They'll be reporting, uh, as you can see, to the to be determined, a director of school performance, but in the meantime, to Mr. Steve Vance, our chief operations officer. Uh, total, there are 83 school site based positions that you can see here, color coded in green, and there are 46 staff and teachers on special assignment which work in the district office. The idea here that you see is ed services and student support services, and the kinds of new positions that are going to be working together so you see a lot of dotted lines that are going to be working together for that ensuring we monitor students all the time and we put in place then in time needed supports we're not going to wait till the test comes out in may we're going to do this recurring process um, there you'll notice family engagement positions some at the district office new ones at the elementary two new at the junior high schools additional college and career counselors through a grant, additional school counselors through our ESSER funds. And uh, as we continue, we will get better at, you know, providing you with reports as to the kind of work we're going to be doing. But again, next week at our Leadership Institute, we're gonna provide a lot more clarity to our school leaders as to how, who and how these positions are gonna to work together so that they can begin planning for their school year as well. So again, this is just a part of a, our org chart. It's not our, our whole org chart. And it's meant to answer the question, who are these positions? How many are there? And how many are really at a school site? How many are, are you fanning up the district office? We're not, <laughs> but it just goes to show that we are gonna have this iterative relationship between us and school site staff. So with that, I'm gonna turn to um, great news, our next slide. Our Santa Barbara Soccer Club under 18 boys won their opener at the US Youth Nationals in Florida. This is a private soccer team, but there are students. There are Santa Barbara students. Uh, if they win tomorrow, they will go into the semifinals this weekend and potentially to the National Soccer Championship. So our very own Oscar Hernandez, who you know usually runs our meetings, is the assistant coach. His son is on the team and is traveling them with this week. And I just thought I'd do a little shout out to that team. Awesome. Congratulations to them. 
Next, I want to just uh, let uh, remind everyone that we did have our official uh, next slide, Mr. Ross, please. Uh, July 3rd dedication of ribbon cutting. Uh, many of you were there with us at Santa Barbara's High uh, Peabody Stadium. And we just want to recognize this milestone. We want to thank all the private donors, along with our community who voted uh, for our bond money that helped to uh, really fund this amazing project that we know is going to just impact for students for generations to come. I want to thank uh, you and all our leaders and staff, Mr. Uh, Dr. Vecchio, who I believe was one of the, the uh, original uh, people who started with this project, uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Simmons, Katie Jacobs, and Greg Tebby and others who really helped this uh, make such a beautiful campus. And last but not least, I want to take a moment to recognize our Santa Barbara High Dons water polo team who won the California State High School Water Polo Championship in Orange County last week. This is a huge achievement and obviously a reflection of a tremendous amount of hard work and commitment. I've asked Coach Mark Walsh to say a few words and he's joining us via Zoom today. But before he does, I do want to say a few words about him. Coach Walsh has been coaching at Santa Barbara High School since 1992 and has been head coach of the boys water polo, girls water polo and swim team since 1997. He's earned 13 CIF water polo championships and coached two Olympians who played for him at Santa Barbara High, Thalia Munro and Kami, Kami Craig. A state championship is very hard to achieve. So the question as you join us today, Coach Walsh, is how did you coach this team, especially during the pandemic, to play at such an exceptional level? And thank you again for joining us and for all you have done for our community. Oh, uh, well, thank you for having us. Um, uh, it was just so exciting to be out um, with the boys um, playing in a tournament. Um, it was the first time we had traveled in uh, 20 months uh, because of COVID and um, the first time we played at any teams outside of our county. And um, we only had a six game season. And this was a group of boys that had won CIF um, two years ago. Um, actually, I think the 14th uh, CIF title. So, uh, but um, my wife just reminded me. Uh, so it was um, really exciting to watch them go out and compete against uh, teams from all over the, the state. And I have a great group of seniors and juniors. We took, um, I believe, 14 kids down there, all uh, seven and seven juniors and seniors. So a very older group, a very selfless group, um, a group that during the pandemic, um, we're just so excited when they could just come to the pool and swim. Um, when they couldn't pass the ball to a partner, they couldn't shoot the ball on a goalie. They had to throw a ball against a backboard. Um, they went through all that because they all want to be successful water polo players. A lot of them want to play in college. Um, they're all driven to be great individual players, but more importantly, they, they really want to be a great team and, and they're really selfless <clears throat> with each other. And it was just fun to see it put all together uh, in display down in Orange County last weekend. Congratulations, Coach, and thank you again for all you have done. Board members, any comments or questions for Coach Walsh? No, just big congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Coach Walsh, and I'm looking forward to meeting you in person. <laughs> Me too. I'll see you at a pool soon. Thank you. And that concludes my superintendent's report. Oh, thank you, Dr. Maldonado. As it is one minute or so before seven, I think I'd like to hold board comments and correspondence until after our regularly scheduled 7 p.m. COVID-19 board report 24. Um, I will turn it over to Superintendent Maldonado and the team to proceed with that report. Remember that this is a report item only and no action will be taken by the board tonight. Thank you, and just to get right into it, we'll ask Dr. Wagenek, who's been our amazing leader in this work, to go ahead and get us started. Um, good evening, board, um, and, and special good evening to um, Mr. Dawson Kelly, our student board member, and good evening, um, Dr. Maldonado. Oh, closer, sorry. Um, so, here we are, board report number 24. Um, so we, we keep going. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
back in, I believe it was May, we first um, reviewed the key factors for 2021, 22, not really knowing where we would be at, at this uh, space and time, and still really not knowing exactly where we will be on August 17th when school opens. But we are, uh, things are becoming clearer and um, the research and understanding is very important right now, especially um, with the Delta variant um, increasing. Um, we are using our oversight and support as we always do, which is the um, CDC, the California Department of Public Health and the Santa Barbara Public Health Department. Um, vaccines are as important as they have been and um, we're watching community transmission right now as it is uh, increasing. And then finally, um, I will touch on some comprehensive testing program information tonight, but we'll give you a full report on that on August 10th. Next slide, please. So um, COVID in Santa Barbara County, currently the case rate has increased consistently since June, and you can, you can see that. Um, with a pronounced, unfortunately, pronounced increase in July. Right now, the daily case rate is 5.2 cases per 100,000. If we were still in the um, color tiered system, we would be back in orange from yellow. Um, as a district, we will remain vigilant and as always follow the guidelines of CDPH and Santa Barbara Public Health in all of our decision making. The Delta variant, which is 50% more easily transmitted than the Alpha variant, the original COVID-19, is present in, present, in, present in our county, as well as in Ventura and of course in Los Angeles. Um, next slide, please. So recent research um, shows that the vaccines available in the United States are effective against the Delta variant. Uh, and though it's still possible to become infected, the vaccines dramatically reduce the risk of serious illness that leads to hospitalization or death. It's important to remember that those vaccinated can contract all strains of COVID and show little or no symptoms. Uh, this is why wearing our masks indoors, and I'll be putting mine back on when I'm done reporting. Um, this is why wearing masks indoors, especially in the presence of those who cannot be vaccinated, such as elementary age children, is so important. As you can see, the rate of vaccination amongst older adults aged 50 plus is higher than those in the younger age brackets. Those ages 12 to 15 have the lowest vaccination rate at 30%. And that's something um, we are looking at and, and uh, want to be a part of increasing. But we'll continue to encourage families to have their children ages 12 and over uh, vaccinated because it's good for the individual and it's good for the community. Next slide. Uh, current status of COVID in our district, we had um, uh, approximately 1,950 students in summer school. We had zero known cases of students and staff with uh, COVID. Um, there were absences um, at, at certain schools uh, because of the need to quarantine, because family members um, were positive. And we did have one high school athlete who was participating in summer athletics. Um, uh, be a positive case. Next slide. So in Santa Barbara Unified, uh, we believe that the surest path to safe in-person schools includes a strong emphasis on the following. Vaccination for all individuals. This will reduce the COVID-19 rates in our community by creating herd immunity. Uh, second, universal masking indoors allows all students access to full in-person learning. And currently the state of California says with full masking indoors, there is no need for distancing. 
Third, um, access to robust COVID-19 testing program as an additional layer of is a mitigation tool um, that has a powerful way of preventing COVID-19 by keeping track of the virus in our schools and preventing outbreaks, especially where student vaccination is not available, elementary schools, or where lower percentages of individuals have been vaccinated, such as junior high and to a lesser extent, high schools. And finally, uh, the practice of contact tracing, which allows us to quarantine those students and staff who need to be at home because of exposure to or a positive case of COVID. This really helps us um, keep the greatest number of schools, of students in school safely when we can do the contact tracing because we know who needs to uh, quarantine or isolate and who needs to, and who's able to come to school. We really want our students at school. Next slide. So as I said, um, we are currently looking at um, our own testing framework. That framework will need to be uh, flexible, nimble, as we learned through COVID last year. Um, and on um, August 10th, I will bring you our framework for COVID testing. Um, for the next school year, we're working with the state government and other organizations to create the most efficient and effective plan for testing our students and staff in a way that will keep track of the virus, prevent outbreaks, uh, respond to any outbreaks that might occur, and help keep our students and, of course, our staff in schools as much as possible. Next slide. Um, summer vaccination clinics. We had hoped that we would be able to host summer vaccination clinics, and um, a number of our secondary schools were willing and able to do that. However, um, the interest in participating in the vaccination clinics um, was not really um, sufficient enough for the neighborhood clinics to be able to justify uh, the staffing. And also, anytime you have a clinic, um, because it's the Pfizer vaccine, it has to be uh, refrigerated and kept safe. And so um, we are working, continue to work with neighborhood clinic to figure out ways that we can provide these uh, clinics. Uh, we'll be communicating with families about the importance of vaccinations and surveying those families regarding their interest in on-campus vaccinations, um, perhaps during return to school events such as Don's Derby, Royal Return, um, Charger Stampede, and then of course the junior high schools. So I hopefully will have a positive update on that on August 10th. And with that, um, Mr. Vizzolini, are you available to share? Is he, uh, has, is he on the panel on Zoom? Yes. Let's go, to the next, let's, let's go to the next slide. OK. Well, I. Um, I definitely know this uh, material. Oh, there he is. Much better from Mr. Vizzolini than me. Go good, ahead, Steve. Good evening, board members and uh, Superintendent Maldonado and members of the public. Um, I'm sorry, Fran, I throw you a little curveball here. I realized this was supposed to be for August 10 and I plugged it into the wrong slide deck, so I'll go oh. today. My apologies. <laughs> um, so uh, cleaning and disinfecting uh, board members, um, as you realize um, toward the end of our COVID when we started opening things back up, the, the guidance was that we could go back to our normal cleaning methods and products, which we are doing uh, daily cleaning in classrooms um, under normal conditions. And as the slide says, um, if we do end up with a positive case, we will revert back to our disinfecting methods. Um, we'll evacuate the room. As you can see, um, our custodians are still properly trained. They have the product in inventory at each school site. Uh, including all the necessary PPE to make sure that they are safe. 
Uh, once, we, uh, that, once we have disinfected the room, it needs to sit for 30 minutes so that the contact time for the um, peroxide product that we're using um, is effective. We install signage on the doors of the affected areas so that no one um, will be tempted to go inside. And then we have a process for notifying the site administrator when the room is clear and is able to be used again. Uh, next slide, please. Also a key factor, as we all know, is the ventilation rates in our classrooms. So um, we are continuing with our practice to keep doors and windows open. Um, fans have been provided for all classrooms. And in many cases, there are numerous fans. Uh, the HVAC systems with fans are all running and we continue to change air, uh, air filters quarterly and more often as needed. And with that, I would like to pass it back to uh, Dr. Wagenek. All right, and um, I want to close. Thank you, Mr. Vizzolini. I want to close by saying that um, on July 12th, the uh, California Department of Public Health released its newest guidelines for COVID um, and how we should um, practice our safety during the 2021-22 school year. We are currently updating our, um, our own COVID safety plan that will be uh, completed this week. Um, and as we, even as we complete it, things are changing. So um, for instance, the wearing of masks indoors in Santa Barbara County um, for all is a change that's happened. And so uh, we will continue updating um, as time goes by and I will have that updated plan for you at the August 10th uh, board meeting. So with that, I'll turn it over to comments and questions. Thank you very much. Um, I certainly hope that you and Mr. Vizzolini um, had a little bit of time for rest this summer because obviously this continues and you'll be very busy as we enter the fall. Um, Ms. Uh, Trujillo, are there any public comments on this item? Good evening, uh, President Ford, members of the board. Yes, we have four speakers for this item. Um, I will go ahead and name them, Jamie Devin. Danny Piola, Heather Blanc Blanco, and Justin Shores. And I will begin with Jamie David. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hi, um, my, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Jamie Davin and I'm a mother of two and I have a daughter entering kindergarten this coming fall. I myself went to Santa Barbara Unified Schools. I went to Monta Vista, La Colina, and San Marcos. My mom grew up here and went to local schools and my husband and his parents. So my kids are third generation Santa Barbarians and this is our home and we love it. And we've loved the Santa Barbara. I love going to Santa Barbara schools. Um, I am really concerned with the prospect of continuing a mask mandate for young children um, luckily, this last year, my daughter was at an outdoor preschool where she did not have to wear a mask. She's been able to go through the last 18 months mostly unfazed, and I'm really extremely grateful for that, as millions of children have not been so lucky. Um, I wanted to just share a story about my niece, who is a fourth grader in Carpinteria, and she went back to school early on last year, as CARP was one of the first local schools to come back to in-person learning. She had her mask on for hours a day, and I watched her suffer frequent and intense headaches and migraines, low energy, asthma attacks, and have actual fear and worry about interacting with other kids, including her family and her cousins. My niece actually wanted to go back to Zoom school when she was back in person, not because she enjoyed Zooming, which she really disliked, but because in-person school felt like prison. She said she couldn't breathe and it was hard to talk. It was hard to hear. How can we expect a child to learn anything under such conditions? We recently took a plane trip with my five-year-old who had to wear a mask for about four hours and it was really hard for her. She repeatedly said it was hard to breathe. She didn't feel good and that she felt zingy, which is how she describes anxiety. And I understand because it's also hard for me as an adult to wear a mask for hours on end. How is my five-year-old gonna learn how to read if she can't see the teacher's mouth moving to make sounds of letters, let alone kids whose first language isn't English? How can our children flourish and thrive and learn anything when they are under stress? 
I have friends and families with kids in other states where they either never had a mask mandate or it was removed months ago and not a single one experienced rampant COVID on their campus. I'd like to see the data, the actual numbers where unmasked schools had rampant COVID. There are private schools in Santa Barbara that had optional masks and I didn't hear of a single episode where COVID went rampant through their communities. Show me the data and the numbers that justify the mandate. The state of California has stated that their guidelines are guidelines. The school districts can decide how to enforce the mask mandate. There is no law that will be broken if Santa Barbara decides to allow optional masks. I think the board needs to justify a mask mandate with actual data and science and studies proving the benefits outweigh the harms, not just because you think so or because someone else said so. I wanna see the actual numbers on how masks on young kids creates more benefit than mm. harms that it outweighs mm. our skyrocketing mental health issues in children. Mm. Make it make sense. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Danny Piola. Hi, uh, thank you for letting me speak here again. Uh, I'm a single mom of two, three children, 15, 13, and a three-year-old. And um, I know that here in this board meeting, in this meeting, everyone wants what's the best for the children. And for I, there is every story has two sides. And I believe that there is people who agree with the mask and people who don't. I am a person that I don't. I think uh, we should be able to choose what is best for our kids. I think um, there is studies that come from Germany and also from American Medical Association Journal that have viewed that children to wear face mask leads to a diverse health effects and deprive them uh, of oxygen and how can they learn uh, in a good way when their brain doesn't get out the oxygen that they need. And also there's a study that in Germany that measured carbon dioxide levels in 45 children aged six to 17 while wearing mask. The normal content of carbon dioxide in the air is 400 parts per million. With anything above 2000, PPM considered unacceptable by the German Federal Environment Office. The German report measured averages of 13,120 to 13,910 PPM of carbon dioxide in the inhaled air of children wearing masks, which is over six times higher than the unsafe threshold. The study, the study further pointed out this measurement was after only three minutes of wearing a mask. Children forced to wear masks at school find themselves wearing masks for hours, five days a week. So I don't know, like I think I, in my conscience, I cannot sleep well at night knowing that I could have harmed a child. And I hope you cannot too. So I believe the best way is to let the parents choose what is the best for their children. You know, if the parent thinks the safest is for the kids to wear the mask, they can wear the mask. But I think for the best for my kids to learn is to breathe fresh air completely to their nose and their face. And they have a great immune system because they take care of their immune system and they can find. And also there is studies confirmed that uh, COVID-19 does not present significant, significant risk of death to children. And now also, there is other studies that says there is more suicide in children than they, than children who got COVID. So I think is this, there is a lot of people saying now that became a tagline saying safe and affected and um, misinformation. It, okay, I just, I just want to ask that I'm able to choose what is best for my children. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Heather Blanco. Ms. Blanco, can you hear us? Heather Blanco, can you hear us?
Ms. Blanco is not responding, so I'm going to go ahead and... Um... Can you guys hear me? Oh, there you are. Yes, go I'm, ahead. I'm sorry, technical difficulties. No problem. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather Blancho. I'm a resident of Goleta. My daughter is 11 and will be going into the sixth grade at Santa Barbara Charter School in the fall. I'm here because I want to express my concern about requiring masks on children while in the classroom for the upcoming school year. Since they cannot advocate for themselves on this decision, I believe it is my responsibility to join the many voices in doing so. I have seen many instances of mental and emotional harm inflicted upon my daughter and her friends by having to wear masks at school. My daughter came home from school lots of times last year complaining about headaches and feeling more tired than normal. She is a normally very active and engaged student and I could tell she was no longer excited to go to school. I have never seen my daughter experience any anxiety or depression since, since before, before this past school year. Children are unable to have healthy social interactions with their faces hidden behind masks. They already spend enough time behind screens and are losing social skills due to this. We do not need to add to these problems with masks and these, with these other challenging issues. I've personally witnessed the impairment of many children's social development and ability to communicate. What are the long-term effects of masking? It is unknown, but we are already witnessing so much fear. Fear to touch things, fear to hug, fear to play, fear of other people, fear of nature, and even fresh air. Wearing a mask should not be a requirement to get an education. Learning how to communicate and take in and comprehend information from others are essential human skills that cannot be taught by reading a book or looking at a screen. Kids need to connect with their peers and teachers in order to fully understand their world. How is wearing a mask helping them with these things? Our children are not driving this pandemic and don't deserve these consequences. They are not the primary spreaders of the virus and have virtually no chance to die from it. We should no longer sacrifice our children's well being by having them wear masks in classrooms. I personally am seriously considering not having my daughter attend public school if there is a mandatory mask requirement at, next, at school next year. I know many families considering the same. I have already started looking into private schooling and I'm also considering homeschooling her with other parents. All parents should have the right to choose if they think their child wearing a mask is worth the harm. I urge you to make indoor mask wearing voluntary for the 2021-2022 school year. Let our kids breathe. Let our kids share their smiles with their friends and teachers. Let their voices be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is Justin Shores. I think you can hear me. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I just I, I echo all, all the ladies that spoke tonight. Um, and I just want to make sure you guys really look at not things that aren't political science, because in California, we're one of the only states doing this. If you look at just just put a uh, take a map out and look at the amount of states doing masks, and it's only us and what and a couple other states. So we need to realize that the border is, you know, we there's science outside of the border. Um, another example is my mom got COVID and she was refused ivermectin, and just the fact that I say that word, if we're in California, this video could be removed from YouTube because it just said that word because we're in the jurisdiction that does not allow it. Another example of that, I had a doctor speak at a, a freedom rally. We're, we're standing up against this in Santa Barbara. We're trying to push back against, against boards doing nothing for us, not standing up for us. We're, we're saying, hey, doctors, can you come speak to us? Tell us your perspective. So I had Dr. Ijen from Cottage Hospital, who's a, who's a Sansom clinic doctor. He's had, he's had patients die from this vaccine. He's seen him in, in hurting from this vaccine. There's another doctor that I know that he sees 16 pages a day at, at Sansom. And at least one of them, he can contribute to a vaccine adverse reaction. So a lot of people are getting reactions, but, and that's a thing that you guys are pushing hard. So now there's reports coming out. I mean, VAERS itself has 16 or sorry, 11,000 deaths, but there's a lawsuit with a whistleblower that came out on Monday and this is please fact check me because I hope you guys look into this stuff because you're pushing it on our kids. Um, there's a lawsuit that came out that said there could be up to 45,000 deaths from the vaccine. So for kids that, who have very little risk of COVID, we should not be pressing an experiment on them. 
we need to slow down guys please slow down you could be killing people by saying take this and when you go outside of california you see a different science so that just tells us there's something wrong so i need you guys to slow down um and hopefully you guys can wake up i, I really think the ventilation thing is good i, I want to go back to that just real quick that's the one thing that we've seen in America that's been working really well. Ventilation is key. So thank you for doing that. That's important. Um, but mask wearing is, a, is not going to help our kids. There is studies on that. You need to look at the Zuckerberg study. I've, I mentioned it before. It's, it bases off the study of Florida versus New York. Florida didn't mask their kids. New York did. We can see the data for COVID. And I know the Delta variant is coming out. And it's kind of scary, but there's not a lot of people dying from it and there's always gonna be COVIDs. So if we keep chasing COVIDs for the rest of history, you're never gonna get out of this, you know, this rut you're in of always doing COVID meetings, which I know you're, you're probably not liking now. We gotta realize there's gonna be COVID. We gotta, we have, and there's treatment. There's treatment for it that's not a vaccine. Fine, thank you. And that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you very much, Ms. Trujillo. Now, board members, do any of you have any further questions or comments on the COVID-19 report? Ms. sims Mountain, please. Yes, well, thank you, a friend, for that update. We continue to, you know, we're just in that spot of trying to figure out what's best for, for everyone. So I appreciate the comments coming from our public who's participating tonight, as well as the report. I did have a question on your slide with regards to the percentage of, I think, under 50, is less than those who are 50 and over. Is that because the vaccine was accessible later for the younger group or? Um, no, what I've um, come to understand from speaking with Susan Klein Rothschild is that um, there is a, a hesitancy on the part of parents to, um, there's just concerns about how the virus or how the vaccine would impact um, young people as a, uh, compared to older. But of course, yes, older folks have had a longer period of time to be eligible. But I think the county expected that the rates of um, immunization would be higher at this point. Thank you for that. And, and is there like an education campaign that's going out, not necessarily pushing, but again, educating around the vaccination? Because there's a lot of misinformation around that and maybe contributing, obviously, to the hesitancy as well. Yes. And I think that's the important piece that we need to be a part of, um, because this is a family choice and decision, is um, getting the education out there, being part of I know there are several groups in Santa Barbara working to um, get the facts out there and educate folks. And so we will be participating uh, in those. Okay. And then I'll just, on the last slide with the big old needle in the vaccination, <laughs> that's a little intimidating. Can we get a more appropriate picture that might want to be more inviting than that? So just think I'll of work that. on that for okay. the tent, yes. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Alvarez, please. First of all, thank you, Dr. Wagenek, for being so uh, proactive and keeping us informed with this constant changes uh, between CDC and CDE and Santa Barbara Public Health. So I really appreciate all the research that you do to bring us accurate information. Uh, thank you very much. And as of, I believe, noon today, we still didn't have any guidance regarding uh, drama and chorus uh, band. I know that there's qu questions are starting to come up, whether we're going to have those activities at the beginning of school. And as far as I know, we, we're still waiting for guidance. So if you have any updated information, we look forward to hearing that. Right. There was none as of, in fact, in the materials that came out on July 12th, they specifically said, we are still working on our guidance for um, vocal and instrumental music. And so uh, hopefully by the 10th, I will have a positive update. Thank you. I have just a couple questions. Um, Dr. Wagner, this might be for you or also possibly for Dr. Be Becchio. Do you have any thoughts on how the UC vaccination requirement um, might impact K-12 schools? What are you hearing? Is this precedent considered to be a very powerful one? 
or is it irrelevant in your opinion? If you're asking my opinion, <laughs> and I, I have one, I, in fact, I was involved in a long conversation about this this weekend. Um, college education is not compulsory. I think that's the difference is we are required to provide and um, folks can make a choice in college. And if they don't want to be vaccinated, they they don't have to attend. And so that that for me is the real this very simple difference. Yeah. Any thoughts, Dr. Becchio? Or you agree with Dr. Wagner? <laughs> I do agree with uh, Dr. Wagner. Those are very similar thoughts that I have about that topic. That's great. Thanks. I, I do think um, that it's a really good point to bring up. So thank you. Also, I thought I would just announce um, I'm very pro vaccinations and the final cottage hospital drive through vaccination after vaccinating, I think, over 40,000 people. The final date is July 29th the Thursday after next. And uh, so if you know people that are still open to vaccinations, uh, they can just show up there during the day and get one. Um, also, I love your comment about the needles, Ms. sims Moten, because the vaccination needle is the smallest one made. It, you barely fill that shot. And it's important that people, especially those who have a little bit of fear about vaccinations, know that. Um, so thank you. <laughs> And um, with that, I think we will close this report. There are no further questions or comments. And so thank you very much. Let's go back to board comments and correspondence. And for tonight, I would like to start with our newest member, Mr. Kelly. Um, hello, everyone. Oh, I'm a little close to the mic. Um, hi, everyone. So. I've been in the Santa Barbara Unified School District pretty much my whole life. Um, I went to Peabody Charter School for elementary and then I went to La Colina and now I'm a junior at San Marcos. Um, just to reiterate what the other um, board members have been saying and what has been spoken on tonight, I really encourage um, people in my generation and people of my age to go get vaccinated, um, not only for public health, but for the potential to open up schools and um, allow this mask mandate to um, be lessened. So I really encourage the shot is pretty painless. Um, best vaccine, best shot I've ever gotten. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would also like to say uh, I plan on focusing on being proactive instead of reactive when it comes to decisions legislatively. Um, I don't want to wait for a problem to happen to make a decision about something. I hope we can be proactive and not let these students fall through the gaps. Uh, let's close them before they fall through. So I'm super thrilled to be a part of this board and represent the student body. So I invite the public to reach out to me with any um, comments. Um, I'm here to help. So yeah, thank you for making this a position as well. Well, thank you so much. Um, we can continue down the line. Ms. Alvarez, please. Well, thank you, and um, I hope everyone got to take a little break. It seems like a long, long time ago when we were last here. And since then, I had the great pleasure to visit the Summer of Learning several sites with uh, Mr. Kelly here, and it was such a joy to see the students learning, to see the teachers, to see the summer school principals. And uh, Ms. Escobedo was actually there when uh, the students challenged us to a joke, which we had no, we did not do very well. And as we moved to other schools, I was, I want you all to know I was promoted. I was promoted by a second grader who the teacher asked, do you know who she is? Do you know who Ms. Alvarez is? And the students enthusiastically raised his hand and he said, your mother. So, <laughs> so I had the pleasure of being promoted to be the mom of a teacher whom I met that one day. So it was quite, quite an honor to do that. So thank you to all the teachers, the principals, all the staff that all the work that went into doing this summer of learning and made such a difference. And it was a great pleasure to see it in action. So thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Caps, do you have comments? Yeah, just a couple comments about correspondence I've received recently. And one was from a parent 
um, whose daughter had quite a hard time with COVID and bounced around a little bit and, and now is going into La Colina and just loved the newcomer um, session, three weeks. Just, it was such a game changer. She said she's walking around a little bit more confidently and taller now as she prepares for seventh grade. And she said, my only criticism was that it was too short, but I just wanted to pass that on because it was so, um, so passionate uh, what a difference this has made in their in their lives. Uh, so thank you to the staff for all of the staff for the work there. Um, the other correspondence that we've all received, I believe, um, in the last few days has been about the school schedule. And I just want to kind of uh, lend my support to the, the parents who are voicing concern about how early we seem to be starting this year and their respectful request that we consider parent and family voices in future years starting next year of 2022 that we move closer to the traditional Labor Day start. Um, so I just wanted to thank the parents for reaching out to us. I, in my time here on the board as a parent, we haven't had parent involvement in the schedule and I think that it's been a missing piece and I welcome uh, the, the, those comments and that perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Ms. Sims Moten. Yes, thank you. So it's it's good to be back. And again, thank you for all the hard work that you're doing throughout the summer. And I too had the opportunity to visit one of the summer learning and I proudly had my shirt on and I was there with regards to that. And uh, at La Cumbra Junior High is where I was there. And I had the um, privilege of having a conversation with two SEVIs. Wasn't quite sure what SEVIs were, but now I know they're going to seventh grade because um, sixth grade was so yesterday. So, um, I said, okay. <laughs> so they shared with me about, you know, their struggles with, you know, being on Zoom. They appreciated that, but they both just kind of said, yeah, it was, it was really hard, um, but we're so glad that we're even, uh, we're able to meet in person, even though we have to wear the mask, but it's so good to see uh, my friends that I hadn't been able to see other than in the thing. And one of the ones, uh, one of the, the little, uh, the young men said, yeah, I was like at the top of my class. And, but Zoom, I just Zoomed to the bottom, he said. <laughs> but he said, but I know now that we're in person, I know that I can fix that. So I just wanna appreciate where his thoughts are that I, now that we're together, I know that, uh, that we can do this and it won't be uh, forever. And they also were just sharing their appreciation because I think they were there to go to the afternoon robotic engineering class that was going on. So they appreciated that. So I, I really appreciate having the conversation to talk to them. And I think it's really important that we can talk on the street level, if you will, with our students, because there's so much that we can learn from them, how they're feeling and how, we, and how that impacts the work that we do. Also, I want to again welcome Dawson. Thank you so much, and looking forward to continue working with you and Sister Fiscal Girl over here. You know, hey, I, I can appreciate that. I appreciate your updates. Looking forward uh, to that. And I think I, I really appreciate the ongoing um, updates that will come because we know that the state budget is is fast and furious, and what's going on with that. And the more that we're up to to date on that, we can make some you know um, quick decisions if we have to do that. So again, thank you so much, and and welcome here as well. Thank you, Ms. Munoz, please. Hello, um, it's good to be here um, with summer. And I know that many of you are working hard behind the scenes and, and such. I also, I heard uh, great comments um, about from a parent with a student at La Cumbre Junior High, who's gonna be an incoming student um, and just how great the program was, the summer program, and, and it feels a lot better about it. Um, also, I attended the No Kid Hungry uh, Summer School, um, summer, the concert series. Miss um, Caps was there with her son, and, um, and uh, Joan Hartman was at the one that I attended at the Galito School District. It was just wonderful to see all the families coming out. I met um, the student volunteers. There was a student who I spoke with who's an incoming uh, Dos Pueblos student. And I told him, don't worry, it's gonna be good. You know, my kids went there, this and that. And, you know, let's get you to meet some people and other students and whatnot. And um, and just, you know, good conversations about such the year that we've had and, and going forward. Um, I also attended the Peabody um, dedication, the Peabody Stadium dedication, awesome day. Um, just appreciate all the hard work of Katie Jacobs and Michelle Gaithan the donors and the foundation and everyone for years that led up to this. It was an honor to be there, um, meet the Cunningham family. I have the presence of the alumni. It was so cool when they said, you know, who are the alumni here? And everybody raised their hands and, 
and such, um, touring the beautiful facility and the track. I'm just looking forward to that. And just a, a quick pitch for considering vaccinations and to keep wearing our masks so that we can get through this safely. Um, we're not trying to push it. You know, um, I know some of us have elderly parents. Um, my mom's going to be 84 next month. So I'm like, okay, mom, let's not go out shopping too much right now. <laughs> you know, let's just be safe. And just if, if each of us do a little part, we can really um, get through this time. Um, so uh, thanks. Good to be here and getting ready for, for back to school. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Um, I have a few comments. First of all, welcome, Ms. Hernandez. We're so happy to have you. And I'd like to share a few milestones that have happened since we met. Uh, first of all, uh, the retirement. We had one employee retire, Samuel Espinosa, the head custodian of Franklin, who retires with over 21 years of service to the district. And so, Samuel, thank you so much for your service, your dedication, and your contributions to our students and our districts. We wish you a happy and a healthy retirement, as well as some greatly deserved rest and fun. Also, uh, while we were uh, not meeting, Dr. Maldonado had a birthday. And so I just want to officially and formally wish her a wonderful, peaceful, and healthy year to come and many, many more. Also, um, late in June, Ms. Sims Moten was lauded and honored by the Isla Vista Youth uh, Project. Uh, one of only two people honored, Ms. Sims Moten received the LEAP Award, which stands for Learn, Engage, Advocate, and Partner. And we're very proud of her and wish to convey our congratulations for all she does for our community and this wonderful accomplishment. So please join me in congratulating Ms. Sims Moten. And yes, the completion of the Peabody track commemorated on uh, July 3rd was a wonderful ceremony. It was exciting and fun. And I'm really grateful to everyone who put this event together, which was really coordinated and envisioned by Katie J Jacobs of the Santa Barbara High School Foundation and Elise Simmons, the principal of Santa Barbara High School. So thank you so much. And finally, I'm just really de delighted to report officially as a uh, to our board that all 6.2 million students in California will have the opportunity to eat meals, school meals for free, regardless of their family's income in the coming year. This is the largest free school lunch program in the country. And uh, although there are numerous cities that already offer free meals for all students, California is the first state to adopt a universal program, which it did late last month. And I'm really proud of that decision because even though about 60% of our students in California qualify for free and reduced meal prices, experts say that the real number of children who need food assistance is much higher in this state with vast income inequality. So this is great news for all, and certainly more states will follow. So at this time, we now move on to public comments on non-agenda items. This is when the uh, public has an opportunity to talk to us about things that are not on the agenda. And so, Mr. Trujillo, do we have any agenda items um, for this public comment section? Thank you, President. Before we do have four uh, speakers on this item, and I will start naming them Trent Williams, Roseanne Crawford, Sheridan Rosenberg, and Sunita Beal. And I will begin with Trent Williams. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Oh, hi. This is Jennifer Williams, um, Trent's mother. Trent plays varsity football for Santa Barbara High School and actually had an event today with his team. So when we scheduled this meeting, um, he did not know that he would not attend. So he, uh, I mean, wouldn't be able to attend because of the football um, event. But he wrote out what he would like me to share with you. Um, California is one of 14 states plus DC to permit pre-registration beginning pre-registration to vote beginning at age 16. Our goal is to increase the number of el eligible 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register to vote. We want to encourage Santa Barbara Unified School District and the school board 
pass a resolution to support high school voter education weeks. The voting numbers um, for 16 and 17 year olds in Santa Barbara County has been dwindling. In 2018, it was 1646. And then in 2019, it was 1602. And then in uh, last year, it was 1,182. As a high school election poll worker at Santa Barbara High School, I would like to propose that Santa Barbara High School and Santa Barbara Unified School District adopt a resolution to promote and support pre-registration to vote of all 16 and 17 year olds. We have a unique opportunity to increase our dismal youth voting numbers if we adopt pre-registration to vote. This program was developed by our Secretary of State, Alex Padilla, and it's supported by Education Code 49040 and by Student Voter Registration Act of 2003. Young adults, as highlighted by recent student protests and walkouts have an interest in politics, yet there's yet that interest does not always translate to votes. Young adults have the lowest voter registration and participation rates of any age group in California. Only 8.2% of eligible voters ages 18 to 24 voted in California's 2014 state election. In the 2016 presidential election, just 53% of California's uh, ages, excuse me, ages of 18 through 34 were registered to vote with an estimated of one in four of those registered voters making it to the polls. A past resolution will likely have a lasting impact on our democratic process in Santa Barbara because research shows that voting can be habit forming. According to learning from LA Youth Vote, if young people turn out to vote in early adulthood, they may engage throughout their lives, Hi. contributing to a stronger democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Roseanne Crawford. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Wow, with all the new $100,000 to $200,000 salaries in administration, we certainly should be able to get to the bottom of why Latino, emergent learners, and special needs children are being left so far behind in outcomes. We should have progress with our fairly new director of elementary education, a change from the stagnant six years prior that saw little change in helping minorities, a new head of family engagement, we hope will really work with families and teachers instead of just showing graphs and theoretical solutions. Where do these people plug in as who is doing what to look at outcomes and evaluate all across the district, including engaging this board? Charging blindly ahead with no plan is not going to get us where we need to be. What's missing from the agenda is addressing three board members' emotional call to action to immediately take charge of evaluating elementary education's English and math outcomes as to why secondary education has such poor outcomes for minorities. This is not a new problem. So what are you going to do about this? Crescendo is a feel-good hype and a cover-up for results. Nothing on this agenda shows leadership or a roadmap. Only one more board member is new, and what actions will the board take to change all this? Can we have on each agenda an uh, item number academic progress to monitor and discuss outcomes? Stop tracking students born in Mexico all the way through school. This is discrimination. Not to offer them the same classes. Let all students have equal access to English and math classes. Increase the number of bilingual teachers' aides in the classrooms. You can have four of them for the same cost as one of your administration positions. Leave one track in English with dual language conversion at McKinley so parents have choice. 
all boats do rise and fall at the same time, even if they don't all start at the same level. Any teacher will tell you in teaching, they have to target to the average of the class. Minority students are now the majority. How can secondary compete with solid A through G classes if students are unprepared in English and math? This is a problem that affects everyone. Fix this in-house. Stop paying consultants to make a bigger mess of things. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sheridan Rosenberg. Hi, thank you. I wanna echo what Roseanne Crawford just said. You know, um, I, I signed up for public comment and after I signed up, I really drilled down on this agenda and I saw E8, yet another contract, $75,000, $74,900, a no bid contract on the consent agenda to uh, Crescendo Education Group, Joe Feldman, obviously for uh, equity training for grading. I think this is a giant red flag. I'm gonna direct this to Virginia. I took very seriously that you were really upset at the last board meeting. I think you were very sincere and on the verge of tears, but I have to say that, you know, I've been speaking at almost every board meeting for almost three years with my colleagues and friends, and we've already cried buckets of tears because we've been boots on the ground in the district with these families. And I could certainly bring you in a room together with these people who will give all of you an earful. This is corrupt on its face. I mean it, stop it. Stop giving money away to your friends and consultants in these no bid contracts. And you know what this, this reeks. This is about basically changing the playing field rather than look at solutions for helping these children and families. You're gonna have more workshops with Joe and you're gonna figure out a way to change the playing field with the grading system. So instead of looking at the real problem with real data and come up with real solutions that will have real results that help these children immediately, you're going to change the way they're graded. And what that will do is definitely muddy the waters and make it abundantly confusing so that no one has a real benchmark on how the district is failing them. Everybody will get a passing grade. No one will be able to really evaluate what these kids need in real time. I know what they need. They need early uh, IEPs right in the very beginning, first grade. I also think all you need to do is replicate what Casey Kilgore is doing at Franklin School. It is not rocket science, it really isn't. Just bring her in, replicate that model, put it to work. You need more community engagement. On Meta, corrupt on its face. You had uh, Maria Lario Swarton, thank God she's out of the district. She was a divisive, abusive person who, I, I mean, I can't tell you how many Hispanic families. I was present when she was basically asking people who were white and telling them to leave meetings because these meetings weren't for them. I heard this over and over again from parents Hi. at school. Thank Please you. do not push this contract through. Start over, do the right thing. Our last speaker is Sunita Buell. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi, my name is Sunita Beal. I've spoken here before. I participated in the LCAP planning committee and I'm speaking tonight to just say I listened to the last board meeting and um, my concern is the assessment that is going to be done with the early education. I was pleased to see the new way of assessing um, the students that are probably in secondary school with grading but these younger students, I think grading isn't going to work for them. And when LCAP was presented, there hasn't really been a clear way of knowing how these younger students are performing. Um, I have another concern, which is that we do these assessments and they happen too late. So during the pandemic, 
I, the um, students were being assessed, I felt in real time. And when they were doing poorly, they were brought in in small cohorts. And then we went to summer school this summer. And I think everybody feels really great that this was, there was this quick assessment and this quick intervention and the students did much better. So my concern with LCAP is it seems to follow this annual cycle. And then at the end of the year, okay, we did well, we did not do well. In fact, when we started the LCAP planning, we didn't even have the data fully together from the three years previously. And so it just feels like there was this lag and this inertia to moving forward. So I would like the board to consider looking at managing LCAP differently so that there's more frequent assessments and more real-time assessments, especially of the younger children, so that things don't happen the following year, but they happen in the same year, the same quarter, the same month, with assessments that are meaningful, not testing that's standardized at the end of the year, but testing or some sort of other evaluation. I'm not an educator, so I don't know how, that that happens very frequently and there's feedback and then there's a good report card that keeps looking better at the end of the year that doesn't look terrible at the end of the year with a plan for the following year. So LCAP reporting uh, shorter intervals for their assessments rather than annually, maybe uh, a report to the board every quarter. And then the younger students being assessed in real time with a measurement that works and that can be put into place right away. Thank you. Thank you. And President Ford, that concludes public comment on this item. Thank you very much, Ms. Trujillo. Board members, now we move on to item number D, the acceptance of donations. And tonight we wish to accept a generous donation of $4,000 from All Saints by the Sea to Cleveland School. So may I have a motion to accept this donation, please? So moved. Thank you, Ms. sims Moten, And a second. Ms. Alvarez, thank you. All in favor, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 This motion passes four to zero. Ms. Munoz is not in the room. We move on to the consent agenda. And remember the consent agenda are the items that are routine, not likely to require any discussion. Dr. Maldonado and her staff have recommended that we approve all of the consent agenda items. And we also have had an opportunity to consider and ask questions about these items before tonight. So first, Ms. Trujillo, are there any public comments on the consent agenda? No public comment. Thank you. And so before I call for a motion on the consent agenda, board members, are there any items on the consent agenda that require more information, comments, or discussion for you? Ms. sims Moten. Uh, yes, President Ford. Uh, it is E10 on the ratification, and it's attachment 12. Um, I need to abstain on the contract for DLL. with for it's, it's directly with First Five, as I'm the director. So we might need to take a separate vote so that I can abstain on record. Thank you. And Ms. Alvarez. I also need to recuse myself from the contract with Montecito Union School. Um, it's my employer. So I, I like to pull that out of the consent agenda to be considered separately. Can you remind me which number that is? Uh, it's in, uh, uh, is it's it 12? Number six. It's uh, B10, number six. It says Montecito MOU. It's uh, for food services uh, between Santa Barbara Unified and Montecito Union School. Yeah. Did you say E6? It's E10. It, e it is oh, E10. I'm sorry. Yes. It's still E10. <laughs> okay. Yes, and it's item number six of yeah. that. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from board members? All right. First of all, I will uh, call for a motion to approve all of the consent items except for E10. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you, Ms. sims Moten, and a second? Thank you, Ms. Caps. All in favor of all of the general consent items um, minus E10, please signify by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 That motion passes unanimously and now moving on to e10 um, may i have a motion to accept this particular item 
Thank you, Ms. Caps. And a second? I need you, Ms. Munoz. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Munoz. So with the three board members who have not recused themselves on this one, please signify by voting, um, uh, by saying aye and raising your hand. Great, the, this motion passes three to zero. And also, would you have voted in favor of it, Mr. Kelly? Yes, thank you. That concludes the consent agenda items right at eight o'clock. And so now it is time for us to move Back to our report items, our regularly scheduled 8 p.m. Summer of Learning um, report. And so I'll turn it over to Dr. Maldonado or Ms. Escobedo. I've asked Ms. Escobedo uh, to share the Summer of Learning report. Ms. Sean Carey has taken a great vacation and she's here with us too. A uh, much needed break. So I, I know that she can add some comments uh, as appropriate. Uh, and I want to thank everyone, uh, as, as has been said earlier by some of the board members, this is the last week of summer learning. More than anything, I so appreciate our teachers, our other uh, teachers on special assignment who stepped up into leadership roles to lead the schools as summer school coordinators. And uh, the joy in the children's faces says it all. Uh, the access, the the use of our beautiful city for learning as an outdoor space has really led to many children really connecting back to the joy of learning. And with that, I'd like to thank Ms. Carey, Ms. Escobedo, uh, and turn it over to Ms. Escobedo to give us the latest uh, report on how it's going. Good evening, board, President Ford, uh, board members, and of course, Santa Barbara community, uh, and Dr. Maldonado, of course. Thank you, ditto. Uh, Dr. Maldonado, I feel like that could have been the board report, but <laughs> I have a little more to, to share with you, and I'm so excited to be able to present this board report myself. Um, big shoes to fill with Sierra and, and Anne, uh, but again, they, they also um, I had some vacation time. So uh, this is our 10th uh, Summer of Learning Report 10th. Uh, we believe uh, there will be um, at least one more. And next slide, uh, one that you are familiar with, uh, our, in Santa Barbara Unified, as you know, the lens through which we focus all our work and efforts is a student-centered equity lens. Uh, this has been evident in all of our summer of learning opportunities for students and adults alike. Uh, Dr. Maldonado already uh, shared with you, next slide please, a little of what is upcoming and uh, next week we are thrilled uh, to be able to host our leadership summer institute equity in action transformational leadership our students our future uh, this is a follow uh, or a part two i wouldn't say a follow-up but a part two to what we started in our learning for our educators learning institute back in june uh, we have, just like in June, some amazing guest speakers. Uh, and there you can see, not to derail us, but I'm going to say it, go girl power, right? <laughs> um, and as you can see, uh, Dr. Maldonado will be uh, uh, leading us on that first day of learning, really talking about transformational leaders. Uh, Dr. Margali Lavades is really going to focus in on equity leadership for our EMLs, as we all know. That is something we are continuing to learn around. Uh, Board President Ford, building our school community uh, and uh, really uh, focusing in on making that the most welcoming uh, space for all our stakeholders. Author Jennifer Abrams uh, will be having us take a deep dive and a very comp comprehensive approach to having hard conversations. Uh, and we are so fortunate and thankful uh, to our great partnership with SELPA um, and having Dr. Mont Montoya, Lupita Olguin Rubio, and Vanessa Lopez from Imperial County SELPA, uh, senior directors and coordinators, uh, join us in that learning next week. Next slide. We wanted to, as uh, you know, and as has been said, uh, Summer of Learning, our SOL program is, believe it or not, in its last week. And uh, we wanted to make sure we gave you an update on 
attendance and how that has gone. Uh, and so overall, our average for elementary has been 88% during this summer of learning. Uh, for our junior high, it has been 83%. And for our high school, it has been an average of about 85%. And although we were aiming, at, we aim every single day for 100%, our summer of learning administrators have reported uh, in our conversations that things like planned vacations, uh, extracurricular activities uh, that some of our students are also involved in, and both COVID and non-COVID illnesses have impacted some of our attendance. Uh, overall, we are thrilled to have any and all, any of our students showing up on, on any given day, and, and we are thrilled to be able to give them the opportunity as often as possible as they've been able to, to come. Um, next slide, please. As you know, it was our focus and our goal to not just obviously uh, work on academics, but to work on making academics fun this summer and providing experiences and enrichment that um, maybe our students have not had opportunity to do uh, um, otherwise. And we are so thankful for our partners and again, all of those the staff that has worked on making these opportunities a reality and to be able to see our students experiencing first of all on Fridays if you haven't noticed you can see blue shirts all over the city uh, from from the desert to the sea right from the mountain to the sea and to be able to see just walk by them without them even knowing who who I am um, and knowing that I'm looking to see what they are saying and how they're enjoying it has just been incredible to see the learning that is happening constantly uh, throughout our city through these experiences. And what you see here um, is a hands-on uh, learning experiences that have happened, uh, again, in elementary, junior high, and high school uh, through STEAM and science experiments um, at the MOXIE, at Camp Whittier, and uh, otherwise. Just, just really incredible uh, opportunities for our students and for them to be able to verbalize um, how exciting and how, how uh, happy they've been in the summer this 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 uh, during these weeks has made it all worth it uh, so next slide we are thrilled to be able to announce and congratulate 13 of our high school students so far and more to come in our next report that have successfully completed the necessary credits to meet their graduation requirements this summer. So these are our summer graduates and um, they did so during our summer of learning um, and uh, making it then more than the best summer school ever, right? Uh, which we've heard, we're, heard one of our students say, this for these students uh, has made it the best school year ever. And congratulations to them. We're so very happy that they continued uh, to put in that effort and now are reaping the the results and success of that next slide so at, in conclusion our co upcoming summer bridge programs although we have had some bridge programs already as as some of the board members have have noted uh, there are others still to come we have our bridge program to kindergarten uh, that um, is either happening this week or happening at the beginning of august we have another uh, opportunity for our sixth graders uh, in a middle school bridge program uh, that will be happening at the beginning of August and uh, the, uh, the same with a, a eighth grade um, bridge program from a middle school to high school uh, that will be com being completed uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we also wanted to share with you uh, these extended, although summer school is ending for the most part this Friday, uh, we are, the learning is not ending. We are extending their uh, sole uh, learning opportunities by uh, being able to give them, these are just a, a couple of examples of these incentives that some of our students are leaving a uh, sole with. And uh, that includes uh, in the elementary, a backpack that includes fiction and nonfiction reading and uh, some really great tips for our parents, showing it to you live here. Kids are so excited about that. Uh, that gives the parents tips 
that they can work with their kids during these next couple of weeks before school starts. And those tips are in English and in Spanish, by the way. And of course, literature, uh, continued uh, reading uh, for our secondary students so that they can just continue to practice um, their reading and comprehension skills. Um, what we would also like, what I would like to end with um, is that in our next uh, board report, so board report in August, we look forward to sharing our academic results also from the pre and post assessments that our students are completing this week uh, so that we can really gauge um, our, the, the fruits of our labor and, and really uh, also give you an update on uh, the rest of our graduates that complete their requirements uh, and are going to be graduating uh, this summer. So with that, uh, this concludes my report. I'd like to ask and, and suggest that this Friday, we all join together in wearing and showing our soul spirit, uh, as it is the last day of summer school for the most part, and wearing your soul t-shirts. I want to see all the blue, a sea of blue um, across Santa Barbara. Uh, you can be sure that I will be wearing mine. So with that, uh, that ends uh, the report, and I will take any questions that you may have. Ms. Mo Dr. Maldonado, did you have another comment to make? I do want to add one more thing. Thank you so much, Mrs. Goyle. And yeah. I want to thank Ms. Carey and the um, high school principals who are organizing a summer school graduation. You heard about a few now, but I believe that's scheduled for August 16th, Ms. Carey. And you will get an invite uh, to, to have us recognize those students. I also want to mention that as I visited uh, some of the high school students myself uh, for summer school, I want to recognize and acknowledge so many students like myself who are holding jobs and going to summer school. And I know Dawson, you were with me when we when we met students who looked a little tired. And you know, my my set, my immediate reaction was, why are they so tired? They're in summer school. And then I asked, you know, why are you tired? And some of them worked in a natural cafe, blenders, other places. I'd like to, if any business. Uh, Community members are listening. I really hope to partner up with some folks to recognize so many of our students are in high school who are carrying both loads. Some also care for their younger siblings and go to summer school. And I just wanna make sure that we recognize those students as well. So thank you everyone. And thank you to Ms. Carey and the high school principals for quickly turning around a summer school graduation. Thank you. Thank you. I think that sounds wonderful. Uh, Mr. Hill, are there any public comments on the Summer of Learning agenda item? No public comment. Thank you very much. So that leads us to board members. Board members, any questions or comments on Summer of Learning? Ms. Munoz, please. Just a comment. Um, first of all, thank you so much and congratulations to the high school students that um, have completed summer school. I was wearing my um, summer of learning blue t shirt <laughs> last weekend when I went to, into a little restaurant over on um, on the east side and this family was looking at me, you know, and stuff and then when I was turning around um, back pick after picking up the order I realized why because their little guy was wearing a t shirt too. Mm. <laughs> so I'm like hey look at we're matching, you know, <laughs> so and <cute>. just <laughs> very, very happy the uh, little guy was, you know. Very happy, and I do follow the uh, Santa Barbara Cleveland Dolphins on Instagram. <laughs> they have great pictures also of their activities with the summer school. So thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to the graduation. Ms. Alvarez, please. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I think by now you know uh, what great joy this brings to me that we've that we've done this for the students and especially to all of you who did all that work and the teachers and everyone else. And then I have a, a question regarding, if you can bring back the slide where it shows the percentages. One request that I have for future meetings is if you could please include the numbers. When I see 68%, how many? I, I, that needs to make sense in my mind of how many students we are talking about. It's 88.8% .8 of 20 of 100 of 200. So if in future uh, meetings, would you please include the total so that that gives a clear picture of what we're talking about? Absolutely. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And then also thank you for arranging the graduation, Ms. Carey. The, actually, I had that on my notes and 
as you said it. So thank you. I appreciate all the hard work. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kelly. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, I'd just like to say thank you again. Um, being there was really incredible and seeing firsthand like how much this is helping these students. Uh, these gaps that start at a young age only get bigger as they age. So um, the, these weeks they have in summer school are truly incredible and it's changing their lives. So thank you guys so much for putting this on. Terrific. Miss Caps, please. Actually, I'll just say maybe it's a little premature, but I'm looking forward to thinking about the future and, and what pieces of this remain uh if if maybe perhaps all because i again just it seemed to have been just out of the park successful so thanks to the work and and maybe we've found a need that we can continue to fill in this community for years to come thank you excellent thank you i uh would only sort of echo what miss cap said and i'm hoping that maybe you'll have plans to survey the students and staff about the summer of learning that's where in my past i've learned a lot from people as they reflect back and you think oh my gosh that's such a brilliant thought so if you could do that or would consider it i think um that'd be wonderful thanks i think that's it for summer of learning and once again uh, miss escobedo miss lafridge and also dr miss carrie thank you so much um we now move on to the action agenda item, which uh, is so fascinating for me. We just have one item on the action agenda tonight. And so I will turn it over to Dr. Becchio because we'll be approving the declaration of the need for fully qualified educators. Thank you very much. Good evening, Superintendent Maldonado. Board President Ford, board members, I am going to actually let uh, Ann Peek, our Director of Human Resources, steal the show tonight. This is her agenda item, so if Sandra could pull her on, she'll present that to you. I think I'm on. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hello? We can hear you, Ann. Continue. Okay. I can't tell from in my office. Sorry about that. Good evening, Dr. Maldonado, Board of Education. I am here for an annual form that we are required by the Commission on Teacher Credentialing to present as an action item as opposed to the consent agenda. It's what is called a DAWN or a declaration of need. The purpose for it is that there are particular credentials that we are unable to um, issue as emergency credentials without this document being approved. One of those happens to be, for instance, um, the CLAD or the BCLAD. We will get an emergency, one of those, for individuals who typically come from out of state. We also use it for limited assignment permits. Um, and sometimes we'll have a need to get an emergency multiple subject and single subject and we have to provide this document to the commission to show um, the numbers that the board has approved at this point in time. The numbers reflect simply a guesstimation of how many we might have a need for. Are there any questions? Uh, okay, hold on, I, I just wanted Clarify that we do not have any public comments. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Trujillo? No public comment. OK, thank you. Then we do open it up to the board, and I'll turn it over to Ms. Sims-Moten. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Anne, for that. I actually remember this. We've, we've yeah. done this before. But could you, for the public and even for my own, uh, what is CLAD and what is BCLAD? Be clear on what those are, because we have those acronyms. Uh, the CLAD and the BCLAD are the California Language Acquisition and Development Certificate. The BCLAD is a bilingual version of that. And that is part of what enables our teachers to teach students that are uh, multilingual learners. I think that's important to note. Thank you for that. It's important to know as we're looking at all the people that are coming in, what are they doing and how we're bringing them in and how it essentially is it supports our students. So if we could be on those acronyms, speak that out and how that um, connects. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from board members regarding this declaration? 
If not, then I'd like to have a, a call for a motion to approve item number one, the approval of declaration of need for fully qualified educators. So moved. Uh, Ms. Capps and a second to Ms. Alvarez. All in favor, please signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. Aye. This motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the, I'm sorry, is it real? The last agenda item. <laughs> um, and it is our third report of the evening. Mm -hmm. And for this, I will turn it over to Dr. Wagenick. This is regarding the first reading and discussion of Exhibit 5144, Discipline Guidelines. All right. Um, hello again, uh, President Ford Board and Dr. Maldonado. Um, we're in my seventh year of this position, and this may be the first time since my first year that I'm a little nervous about presenting. And it's, it, I'm going to be a little personal and transparent because this has been a long time coming, and it really is um, so very important to all of the work that we are doing right now, all the things that we're talking about, about student achievement, um, which is we're in the business of educating students. Um, and so uh, this is, like I said, it's been a long time coming. And maybe it's not um, anxious or nervous, but rather it's just excitement. But thank you um, for this opportunity. So next slide, please. I want to start, um, I'm not going to bury the lead. <laughs> and that is that um, we have disproportionality of exclusion in our district. New research continues to find no evidence that students of color or those living in poverty engage in rates of disruptive behavior significantly different from others to justify higher rates of punishment. Yet, in 2018-19, which is our last full year of data on behavior, 75% of the suspensions and 82% of the expulsions in Santa Barbara Unified were of um, Latinx students. Yet our Latinx students make up 60% of the total student population. Furthermore, Students in special education accounted for 32% of the suspensions, of all suspensions, but only make up less than 13% of the total student population. But they're a third of our suspensions. Next slide, please. I do want to talk um, a bit about the why. And it's because of the old philosophy. And this is the philosophy that um, I think uh, part of um, why I feel so passionate about this is because I operated under this old philosophy for many years. It was the way that we did business. You know, in the 1980s and 90s across the country, there were fears concerning drugs and, and violence in schools that led to policies that increased the range of infractions and length of suspensions and expulsions. This approach um, mirrored the zero tolerance policies that were put in place by federal, state, and local governments during that same time. And those policies resulted in the targeting of black, indigenous, and other people of color for arrest, prosecution, and incarceration. So, that zero tolerance policy um, exists to this very day. And, and it became, it's just what we do. Those are our guidelines that we currently have. We have some zero tolerance policies. Almost 40 years ago, um, researchers theorized that graffiti and abandoned buildings and panhandling and other signs of disorder in neighborhoods would create an environment that, that would lead people to commit more crime. So the answer is, make sure you don't have 
broken windows and graffiti and disorder. And then environments will be um, calm. And soon this theory was extrapolated to schools and used by administrators and teachers to justify zero tolerance and making examples of students as young as five years old, suspending and expelling, even younger than five, three-year-olds being um, removed from preschools um, because of behavior, because of zero tolerance. Broken th uh, window theory has been researched, and really it shows a lack of understanding of the variables that influence behavior, yet we see here time and time again that, well, we have to make a, uh, an example of this student, otherwise all students will be doing it, and it will be chaos, chaos and mayhem, um, and this simply is not the case. Um, also in this context of the old philosophy, and I'm going to, to pause before I speak about unconscious bias, and that is, um, you know, we all have biases. We all have implicit biases that that um, are unconscious to us. My, myself, absolutely. Um, so, in this context, um, unconscious or or implicit bias is defined as the mental process that causes us to have negative feelings and attitudes about people based on their characteristics, such as race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, appearance, etc. And because this cognitive process functions in our unconscious mind, we are typically not consciously aware of the negative racial biases that we develop over the course of our lifetime. But research by organizations such as the Kirwan Institute and the UCLA Civil Rights Project suggests that implicit bias is implicated in every aspect of racial and ethnic inequality and injustice, including in our schools. And one of the most powerful consequences of implicit racial bias is that it often robs us of a sense of the ability to have real compassion for and connection to the individuals and the groups in our schools who suffer the burdens of racial inequality and injustice. And then, you know, very simply, the old philosophy, um, it just is much easier to, to use. It's very simple to say, well, you did this, and your punishment is this. And, and I, that does have an impact. So that was a lot, but here comes the good news. Next slide. Well, the Latin origin of the word discipline is dis disciplina, uh, which means instruction and, and knowledge. However, in the education world, um, that word usually evokes certain thoughts and images. We probably all have certain thoughts and images when we think of school discipline. As such, in our, uh, we started doing this last year, and in a sense, we started rebranding the word discipline and began referring to it as response to behavior. Instead of disciplining, which, which has taken on a, a connotation, it's how do adults respond to behavior, to student behavior. Our practice will no longer be one of reaction and punishment. Instead, we respond to student behavior so that we can help them. Help them learn how to manage their feelings in situations that are leading to unproductive behavior. So how do we do that? First, we take a page out of Stephen Covey's, uh, one of his many books, um, and we seek first to understand. We dialogue with students and we say, what happened? You know, and really dialogue back and forth. Maybe they don't know why it happened, so we help them understand that. We seek first to understand. And with that, once we understand, we can, we can move on to addressing the root cause, identify the root cause, and address it. Um, because uh, it could be academic frustration, it could be trauma, 
drug and alcohol use, family concerns, bullying, all of the above. But unless we know what the root cause is, we aren't going to be able to help that student ultimately learn how to regulate their behavior. And that's what we need to do. And then finally, the new philosophy is, is based on the Bantu or Zulu philosophy of Ubuntu. The idea of I am because we are. Ubuntu is action oriented. It's asset based rather than deficit focused. And in this context, it celebrates students lived experiences and their potential. Every student in our school is, is a part of the we. If you suspend a student, or expel a student, they are no longer a part of the we. So um, our students, even as they exhibit dysregulated behavior, they're part of our school community. And as such, they should be recognized for what, excuse me, what they bring to that community. And even as we help them learn how to regulate their behavior. Next slide, please. So in addition to um, this new philosophy that we've been adopting over an, uh, really a, a number of years now, we're adopting a set of guiding questions to anchor our work and to keep us focused on promoting equitable approaches to student behavior that are culturally appropriate, they engage our families and our community, and constantly emphasize positive and preventative approaches rather than consequences such as those used under zero tolerance. Um, and we do this so that disproportionality of exclusion becomes a thing of the past. But the, the great thing is that this, this approach serves all of our students. This is the ultimate tier one uh, way of doing business. Next slide. So uh, the exhibit, um, the proposed um, changes to exhibit 5144 that I'm bringing forward tonight, um, I do want to share with you the process that we took to take the old set of uh, discipline guidelines and create the guidelines that we're considering tonight. Um, a work group was assembled that was comprised of a diverse cross-section of district employees. Um, this included um, assistant principals, deans, school counselors, um, student services staff, and the work group met monthly over a six month period of time and, and used those guiding questions, those reflective questions um, uh, as the foundation of our work. Um, after the initial draft was developed, we met with a series of stakeholder groups. And um, as you can see here on the slide, we started with students. Um, Dawson may have been in that group, I don't, I don't recall. But um, we, then we met with principals, assistant principals, and deans. Next, we moved on to certificated and classified staff, and we included representatives from SBTA and CFEA. Um, we met with community partners, and I think parents could be down at the bottom there. Um, the parent uh, meeting was um, one of the most um, amazing uh, experiences that I've had professionally in the last maybe in the last decade. It was truly amazing to hear them um, talk about this and their appreciation for it. And to tell stories, it ended up being a time for them to really tell stories of how um, the old philosophy had impacted their children. Uh, next slide. So, um, 
The document itself is divided into four sections. Um, the first are type one behaviors. Uh, these could include things like um, minor property damage, such as um, writing on a desk or some form of graffiti, disruption, dress code violation, um, use of profanity. Um, in this new um, set of guidelines, we are, are saying you may not suspend for these behaviors and you may not recommend for expulsion. Um, instead, uh, a series of interventions and alternatives will be utilized. Type 2 behaviors. Um, principals have broad discretion. They may suspend or recommend for expulsion. But what we're saying, and this is very important, and this is, um, this is going to be the biggest change, and it is that you may only suspend students if their presence on the campus constitutes a danger to themselves or others. I'll say that again. Only if students present a danger to themselves or others, if allowed to be on campus, will they be suspended. There's really no other reason other than safety under the new philosophy to suspend a student just because you can. Um, these types of behaviors um, really are anything from um, a mutual fight, um, possession of alcohol or, or drugs, um, possession of dangerous objects, theft, et cetera. Um, again, the principal has discretion, and if the student is a safety concern, suspension is allowed. Um, type three, um, there's limited principal discretion, um, and they may recommend for expulsion unless particular circumstances render this inappropriate. So, for example, um, an assault on a school employee. What is an assault? Um, brushing past a school employee with a bump of the shoulder um, while trying to get out of a doorway. And I use that example because students have been expelled in our district for that behavior. That is something that the principals would have discretion to say whether or not the student should be recommended for um, suspension. They can be, um, I mean, for expulsion. They can be suspended, but we're asking that we really use other means to determine whether that student needs to be expelled. But even when there is a suspension and an expulsion, we still do alternate means of support, always. And we've been doing that for a number of years. And then finally, um, the type four, which um, if we can scroll, if, there, if there's any way to make that so we can see it, there's no principal discretion. Type four violations are what we call the big five. This is possession of a firearm, brandishing a knife, selling a controlled substance, committing or attempting to commit, commit sexual assault or possession of an explosive. Any of those five is an automatic five-day suspension and a recommendation for expulsion. There is no principal discretion, and those clearly and obviously present a danger to students, staff, and the school community. Um, but we still, Uh, use appropriate supports, um, we implement restorative approaches, and we're always working when students are expelled to ultimately return them to a traditional school. Next slide. So um, 
we clearly don't have time in this meeting for me to go through the entire document line by line. And none of us would want that to happen. I know that you've had time to review it and you will have more time to review it before um, this goes to consent if you choose to vote to approve it. Um, but I pulled out one specific type of behavior to briefly review with you, and that's drug and drug or alcohol possession, use, furnishing, or sale. This is our second most common type of suspension in the district, second only to physical violence. Um, so under the new guideline, we are proposing that unless a student sells um, drugs or alcohol, that instead of suspending, we uh, review their previous behaviors, we conduct a root cause analysis. Why is the drug and alcohol use taking place? Um, we meet with the parents. And it says with conference, it will be conferences. It's important to have the family involved in this. Um, referral to behavioral health agency using appropriate mental health supports having students be um, assessed um, and really trying to help them um, make changes is the bottom line. And then um, we do have the alternatives to suspension menu that you will see and you'll be able to, I'll provide you with the, um, the Google Doc on this so that you can look at the alternatives to suspension menu and see what we are developing to guide our, our administrators. So the idea is to treat what's going on and to provide support. The alternative is if, if a student is selling a controlled substance, that's one of the big five, and therefore has the five day off campus suspension and the recommendation for expulsion, but also the support in line there. So I do request that the board approve the proposed guidelines on consent at the August 10th board meeting. And I will turn it over now for questions and discussion. So Thank you. Next slide. Thank please. you very much, Dr. Wagonek. Uh, Mr. Heal, are there any public comments? No public comment. Oh, thank you very much. Um, before we go on, I just have a couple of quick questions that may um, may help. First of all, I wonder if you go back to the slide about um, controlled substances. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could describe for the board what um, a root cause analysis might look like in the case of a kid coming uh, drunk to school um, and or restorative approaches, for example, if a kid came drunk to school? Certainly. Um, a, student, um, a student comes to school and they are under the influence of alcohol, they're drunk. Um, the first thing would be, in this new philosophy, what we'd be doing is um, calling their uh, parent or guardian or a trusted you know, family member and have them go home first. Um, you really can't conduct due process and all students have the right to due process. So that means to be heard and know what they're being what, accused of. You really can't provide fair due process when someone is under the influence of drugs or alcohol. So we would send them home. Um, and, and, and you know, want to talk with the, the parents or the family members about what's going on. And that in itself can, can be interesting, depending on the dynamics of the family. Um, the root cause analysis really starts with that due process meeting, where you're asking the student, tell me what happened. What was going on? What were you thinking? Um, but probably most powerful is the fifth part, which is the referral to um, mental health services or behavioral health. And as you know, we have those on our campuses. 
And so um, we actually started two years ago doing um, assessments of all students who are suspended um, for drugs and alcohol. So we've been doing that for a number of years. We, initially, that assessment tells us, does the student have an addiction issue? Do they need more behavioral health issues? Or is this a mental health thing? Are they self-medicating because, um, because they have anxiety or depression? Um, and that tells us, and we learn more through that process, through the therapist saying, OK, here's what the student is telling me is going on, and they've told me that I can share. So that's a lot of the root cause analysis, is dialoguing a number of different people, dialoguing with the student and doing the assessment. It's also talking to the family. It's also looking into the family background. What's their situation? How can we help them? Um, in terms of the restorative practices, it kind of depends on what the situation is. If the student um, came to school drunk and threw up in the classroom, um, there's some <laughs> restoration to be done in the classroom. Um, I can tell you it wasn't necessarily the case with students who are under the influence of alcohol. But when I was a principal and an assistant principal, I used to talk to students about the fact that if you go into class and you smell like marijuana, and your classmate sitting next to you is trying to stop smoking, you're actually triggering them. So it's these conversations like, who did you impact by your behavior? Do you, do you need to, to restore things with your parents or, or, or your little sister or whoever it is? So it's through those dialogues again that we find out, you know, where does the, the, the relationship need to be mended? Thank you so much. I think that's really helpful. Um, even as much as we try, I think sometimes our educationees <laughs> um, can kind of get in the way. And these are two big, important terms, um, root cause analysis and restorative practices right. or approaches. Thank so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, board members, are there any comments or questions about the, the new approach? Please, Ms. Munoz. I certainly um, support it and appreciate your presentation on this and, and frank um, discussion on it, right? Because honesty and the, um, the reality, right, of what we've seen for years and so forth. And I, you know, am happy to have our student board member here um, who certainly has um, awareness of this, you know, just like um, those of us that are in the community every um, two weeks i've been meeting with the youth violence prevention group that we have here um, including our you know ismael huerta our youth outreach worker extraordinaire and and others um, and talking about what's going on in the community and what we're seeing there is you know there's students of our school district right mm -hmm. and their need for support and the summer and after covid and so forth mm -hmm. And it is. It's there's disproportionality in terms of how um, how the shakes down. So I certainly, um, uh, uh, you know, the uh, um, in terms of the involvement of the community partners, the parents, the students, and all involved. I mean, I couldn't be more supportive of this, and look forward to to having it implemented. Thank you, Ms. Caps. Yeah, thank you. I also am, uh, just want to thank you, um, Dr. Wagenek, for your heartfelt introduction to give the context to the evolution of where we are. That's really helpful. And uh, I can tell how much this matters to you and, and clearly will matter to the lives of our students and, and hopefully be a step in the right direction. Uh, and so I'm just curious because this is, this is uh, an evolution. You mentioned the stakeholder outreach was fantastic, but how are you training um, for this to actually have real life implications in the classroom in real time? And specifically, um, one of the demands of the Black student youth was uh, de escalation training. Mm -hmm. And if you could also answer that question by referencing uh, that specific um, element to this work. Thank you. Um, so I'll address that and start with the administrators. So Clearly, you saw that one of our stakeholder groups were our principals, assistant principals, and really our deans have been 
even the ones who weren't on the on the work group and the elementary APs um, had been part of this ahead of time, been dialoguing. Many parts of this are not new, but um, all of our administrators will be trained next week at our Leadership Institute. So we have one session dedicated specifically to this new way of doing business. One training will not be enough. We'll need to continue talking about it, having dialogues. But again, we've been dialoguing um, for a number of years. So that's very helpful. Um, the other piece is that the, the deans and the elementary assistant principals are going to have an additional training after that, sort of a train the trainer model um, to take that to their school sites for the beginning of the school year to do training with, with teachers and other staff. Uh, in addition to that, um, we have student services staff who will be doing a variety of different trainings throughout the year. Um, Laura Wooster Dorfman will be bringing back the restorative approaches trainings one and two. Um, Ali Cortez and Ismail will be doing trainings. Jennifer Belacious is, is organizing all of that. And then we have our youth outreach workers, our four new ones who um, will be also equipped to um, provide support to teachers and staff within the schools. So there's that. One position that we've added that's new that was on the, the chart there um, at the beginning of the meeting that Dr. Maldonado showed was a behavior specialist for general education. And he is going to be doing those de-escalation trainings specifically and a number of other um, trainings on how to respond to students who are um, externally um, behaving, like, you know, act, quote, acting out. Like, how do you work with a student who the only way they can communicate how they're feeling is to be um, destructive and um, perhaps violent? So how do we do those things? So um, he'll be focusing on that at the beginning of the year. Um, so we have another, uh, just a number of, of pieces to this. Um, it won't be a one and done, you're good to go sort of thing. And it will be an evolution. Um, we'll need to assess um, where you have to look at data and be watching. We have to have some difficult conversations, but we also need to, my phone's not here, but we have to be at the other end of the phone to answer questions and help coach our administrators through this as as they are adjusted. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Ms. Sims Moten, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you for this very um, timely report. Um, you know, in 2016, when we came on this board, the first thing that we heard from our disproportionately students who were impacted by the, the, the drug dogs mm -hmm. and how passionate they were, you know, with regards to that was one of the things that the board definitely said that we would not be renewing that contract. Yeah. So that certainly was a part of the old philosophy. Yeah. And so this says that we still have some ways to go and it's evolving over time, but this certainly is a big step in how we're getting there too. Because this is a community of folks. How are we treating each other in this community? And you, you spoke about the impact of others if you're coming in smelling like you're impacting your neighbor. So how do we make sure that we have a healthy, you know, um, empathetic community that our students are learning that as a part of that. So I, I appreciate where we're going with this. And I also appreciate because we talk about the root cause that how important it is to include the new philosophy to include our preschools because that is very, you know, that's sadly that's data that, you know, three year olds are being expelled disproportionately as well. And so I think as we look at our behavior specialists, it's important to make sure there's cultural proficiency, that they understand the cultures of how kids are what they're coming in, and, and to also to talk about Dr. Mapp, I think that her name is about the ecosystem. So we've got to really be able to understand their ecosystem of our students and how do we then you know incorporate that and in, in where we're going. And then and then also I was just thinking in back in the early parts of when we talk about root causes like for first five, how are we looking at um, supporting through home visitation from the very beginning as these students are, you know, particularly into our, to our thing. So how do we then incorporate that? Um, 
in the things that we're doing because we're focusing on systems change, which this is part of. And so I, I want to, uh, that made me think about something in terms of what we need to do in terms of home visitation when we first meet those families and, and how we need to do that and make that connection. Um, and then lastly, I just have a question, uh, you know, with regards to um, when a student comes in under the influence of, let's say, alcohol or whatever, and we're saying we're sending them home. So some of them are of a driving age. So how are we making sure they're safely getting to where, you know, home or however we're doing that? Right. We never send a student home um, on their own. Okay. So uh, it would be wait, wait until someone can come and get them. Um, I can tell you it wasn't always that way. Right. But in the last number of years, we, yeah, we, it's got to be someone picking them up. And those students that are 18 year olds, do we treat them a little bit differently? So do we have to contact their parents or are we just a part of the process that we do it, even though if they can? Um, with 18 year olds, uh, the way we should be handling it is, is saying to them, you know, your parents need to know about this. Um, we need to call them. Are you, you know, and I never had a student say, you can't call my parents. I mean, I had plenty of students say, don't call my parents, <laughs> <laughs> almost invariably. But um, no. So, yeah. Okay. so yeah, if we, we can... try to involve them if they're living with their parents. Some aren't, but that's the general rule. And, and then lastly, I would just say that I think as we start to evolve in this is that it sets the expectation as students are coming into this district, what is expected of them and how we're going to treat and support them. And I think that also lends itself to value how we value them. And I think the easier when we was easier on the old philosophy, it was easy to feel invisible because you could just, hey, they're just going to dismiss me. I could just, you know, be home for five days and they mm -hmm. don't really care. But this way you really are. Uh, making them visible, right? In terms of we're going to really look at how you're feeling, why you're doing this. So I think this is a good thing in terms of that too, increasing the visibility and the value uh, of students and they're feeling much more valued. So I appreciate where this is going. I certainly thank them. I'm glad that I'm here <laughs> to see this going forward. And so, um, I, and I look forward to, to how it continues to involve in a positive way. Ms. Alvarez, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Waganek, for your excellent presentation, and thank you for answering my many questions that I sent you today. I really appreciate that. Um, I've been, I, I, as you know, I've been following the data and suspensions, and unfortunately, I, I have from 2015 to 2018, and of course, our suspension rate has grown, mm -hmm. and um, our suspension rate is actually higher than it's high since our county in, in yeah. California in the state of California. So I'm really interested in seeing the data of now that you are implementing this new process of how we're doing. And if we are not doing as well as we should be doing, then of course, you know, we look and say, what can we change? Yeah. So I'm looking to have more of those frank conversations such as you did tonight, so that we know what's working what's not working and what we need to change. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. And then I have a couple of other questions. You mentioned that there's gonna be trainings of admin and, and school staff. Will there be ongoing trainings, ongoing check-ins so that this is implemented with fidelity and also as we get new staff, staff turnover, are there systems in place that we continue this training for our staff? So um, first question about monitoring. We have had a system and you know, we've been doing restorative approaches since 2012 in this district. And, and really without, I'm gonna keep it short, but the reason why it was not fully successful is because we still held on to, held on to the old philosophy and tried to use the new approach and, and they were, you know, they didn't mesh. But we have, in the, it, for six years, we've had a workable system that we have pockets of excellence where it's being used. And so 
part of that is teachers actually um, in Aries indicating when they're doing um, these actions for tier one type behaviors and and their use of restorative approaches and and positive behavior approaches and so forth and so we're in fact um, Mr. Venz and I were talking about this today is how do we keep that we need to track that and so we're going to see if a school isn't utilizing those systems for keeping track and monitoring um, we're going to see that but but also within our professional learning community with assistant principals in elementary with our secondary deans we look at the data and so that's an area where I'm going to be very much like, where's your data? And if schools are not doing it, if teachers are not doing it, we're going to know. And then we have to have some hard conversations and do another root cause analysis. Why isn't this happening? So um, oversight and monitoring is going to be absolutely essential. Um, and also our suspension rate. We'll know. I mean, I'm Mr. Rouse has helped me find a way where every day I can run a list of the suspensions that are done and what for. And so again, conversation. Thank you. And then one last thing. Uh, we need to educate the parents about this. What's yeah. the rollout plan so that we educate the parents in this component? So that is a, a good question and with um, you know, with that role of family engagement um, needing to be filled, we'll need to work with family engagement, both both at the district level and the site, but that's our next phase that we need to plan for. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kelly. Uh, I would like to say uh, thank you for including student input as well uh, in terms of our discipline. A lot of times I, oh, the students don't know how their disciplinary action work and um, the ways we go about disciplining, or I guess responding to behavior of mm -hmm. students. Um, I, I would also like to say this is a perfect example of being proactive when it comes to um, response to behavior. Uh, a lot of times I would see students feel isolated and publicly shamed when it came to the ways they're being disciplined. So uh, this is a great step in the right direction. Uh, a lot of people were isolated and they didn't feel like they could get the help they needed from not only their fellow students, but also their teachers. So thank you for this. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, and finally, for me, um, well, first of all, I think your nervousness may have been caused by your passion and your commitment to get this right. And um, having been a long time educator myself, I, I can completely appreciate the historical context that you shared. Um, it's all completely true and the evolution of how we've been responding to student behavior. I'll just reiterate for our new board member and all members and also for the public that in the name of fairness and equity, this board has said that the overrepresentation of Latinx students and the disproportionality of suspensions and expulsions in this district are completely unacceptable and you have always agreed with us and I know that you're moving forward on this. Um, it is the school to prison pipeline that we must absolutely um, rid ourselves of. And so thank you. I also want to clarify that um, just because we are changing the approach, it doesn't mean that we're not doing anything. I think some people might read into that that oh you're just not you're just going to let kids misbehave. And of course, the opposite is true. We're actually going to do something that matters and will impact change. So for that, I thank you. Um, board members, I want to reiterate that she has asked to have this come back on the consent agenda. So hopefully all of your questions have been asked so that we can do that at the next board meeting on August 10th because um, I'm sensing there's a lot of agreement with this and I know you want to get things started. So it takes place immediately when school starts. That is the plan. Thank you. Any further comments, Dr. Maldonado? No, I just want to thank Dr. Raganek uh, for all of her work and, and uh, commitment to students and equity in our district. And her work uh, needs to be elevated and recognized just like everyone else in our cabinet. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, there are no um, consent agendas. Agent 
agenda items to return to. So I would just ask board members, please refer to agenda items J and K also for coming events and future agenda items. Um, and please let us know tonight or in the near future of any additions you would like to make to these lists. Ms. Alvarez. Would you, uh, Dr. Maldonado, would you please bring us an update at the August 10th meeting on the independent study up, uh, requirement now and uh, projected fiscal impact, if any? Yes, we just received the new guidance today, so I will definitely have that for the August 10th meeting. Thank you. I do think that's going to come under probably a bigger umbrella, the legislative changes and the fiscal impact, which yes. there are a number that we're hoping that you'll share with us. All right, well, then I will just tell everyone our next meeting is a regular meeting of the school board on Tuesday, August 10th, 2021. We'll begin at 6.30 p.m. And at this time, the plan for the meeting is to be live streamed. So I'd like to just share one other bit of information um, that I'm so pleased to hear about. I'm very um, high on our state, as you might have guessed. And there is some news also today related to our commitment to ensuring that all students have access to the highest levels of curriculum in order to uh, maintain readiness for college and success. The tide is definitely changing. For the coming year, University of California reviewed the applications of 2, uh, 203,000 freshmen and ended up admitting 161,000 freshmen and transfer students. This was the all-time high number of students, and 43% of them, almost 37,000, are coming from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups. So we go forth. We will not sit back on our loyal, uh, our laurels. Um, in the words of Socrates, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And there's so much new to be built. Today's meeting of the Santa Barbara Unified School Board is adjourned. Good evening. <laughs>